Hi, folks. We need to machine some Makor. What is Makor? We'll get into it. But this is a pretty fun video on looking at a semi-production run on the Tormach 440. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. So the task at hand is, is the 440 up to the challenge? I don't have all the details from the customer, but it sounded like they had this material machined, perhaps in-house or another facility, or maybe it was a subcontract job, and they wanted to know, can a 440 do this? I believe they were doing it on a vertical machining center before, and I thought, this is amazing because there's no reason to spend $100,000 to do this. We pulled the vise off, and I thought about setting this material up right on one of our Saunders fixture plates, and then I realized, you know what? This is a vacuum job. The customer sent us the material already taped down to this piece of aluminum. And that aluminum plate really was gonna work perfectly for a vacuum. We didn't have a small enough vacuum plate, so we took our Pearson, and because we had the fixture plate, we're able to pretty darn easily hold it down on the 440. Definitely not a normal setup, but it actually worked fine. The machine has no problem with that little bit of aluminum weight hanging over the front end. So when I'm setting up a vacuum plate, I like to just use a quick Sharpie to set up my rough lines of where I want to put my gasket material down, get it in place. Now it didn't line up with grooves in the Pearson, so we just use some gauge blocks inside the grooves and space it off of those, and that lets us make sure that our part stays square to the table. Pearson on. I love that sound, but... Now, because the customer sent us the material taped down, I wanted to sweep it really quick with the Heimer just to make sure it was flat. I'm trying to avoid any sort of surprises. Uh, this is a relatively expensive material. I believe about $100 for the piece that we're looking at. So not the end of the world, but definitely an example of where I wanna make sure we don't uh, goof. And so checking to see it's flat and it's within one thou, if not two across all, I think this is a six inch piece. That's great. As I mentioned, the customer had had this run before, so they had some G-code. It's really not a good idea to use somebody else's G-code because of tool issues and machine issues and post-processor, and it's pretty risky. Uh, there is actually a world of machining where folks will basically rent your machine, but you work with them to get the right tool library and feeds and speeds and profile setup. So what good does G-code give us? Well, I wanted to get a better understanding of how they had cammed up the part. So go to ncviewer.com. This is awesome. And a big shout out to Xander for putting this software out. Click open. I'm gonna open that file and take a look. The information that you get here is priceless. I get a view of what that program looked like. I can see how they had set it up, how they had patterned it. So all of that is very useful, but I can also go in and look and get an idea of how did they scallop or parallel down on the top of that. I can even click lines and look at the code, which isn't super useful to me, except I can then jog through and I can search or look for feed rates to get an understanding of how they cammed up this part. So I highly recommend taking a look at ncviewer.com. So anytime you're testing a new material, or what I like to say, the stakes are high, run a test. In this case, I changed the speeds and feeds to what I thought would work on aluminum because I trust the fusion, I trust the simulation, trust but verify. And so I thought, let's make a couple of pieces of aluminum. I'll have a lot more confidence. I'll probably make some changes to the tool paths as I go through that. Then we can go on to the material that's in this case, a little bit unique, hard to replace and customer provided. Does anybody recognize what's different about this tool path recipe that's very unusual for us? There's no 2D adaptive. We love the 2D adaptive and 3D adaptive tool paths. They're great, they're super reliable. They're one of my favorite things about the Fusion 360 cam, but it doesn't make sense here. Why? Because the distance between the parts is about 0.1 inches. So if we take a look with 0.1 inch distance and a two millimeter end mill, we've got about 20 thou gap between the tool and the workpiece. And the adaptive, to be blunt, it just chokes on itself. It's it would work, but two things. One, the computation time takes forever because of the way that algorithm works. And number two, your tool path time is just too slow, uh, both because you're covering too much ground by trying to do small little loops, and you've got some machine acceleration, deceleration parameters that just, it just doesn't make sense. So. We fix that by doing 2D contours. We're ramping down by going to the linking tab and checking ramp. We're also doing multiple depths. 
By doing that, in conjunction with multiple depths and, this is important, roughing passes, you'll see that we're machining two widths of cut here. So as we move down to the next layer, we're not really slotting the full depth because we've got some room above it for the chips to help evacuate, which is really important to helping with chip evacuation in conjunction with the air blast from our fog buster. So when you've got a new material, take a knife or a deburring tool or a file and get a feel for the material. Here, I'm just taking my pocket knife and I'm getting a sense of how does this cut? Does it turn to dust? Does it want to fracture or chip? Does it actually let me create my own chip with a knife where I can kind of carve it and sculpt it? And to me, I wanted to just make sure we had an idea of what this was going to act like. Speed rate override low spindle, knock test, here we go, here's the big moment. Uh, two things I'd wanna point out. One, when you're doing machining with small end mills, in this case it's a two millimeter end mill, it's about 80 thousandths of an inch, you've got to check the tool run out. Card here to the video when we made a Lego mold. That's such a key thing when it comes to your feeds and speeds. The other thing is work holding. Look what happened, watch this. So we're machining all the way through and the remaining amount of tape underneath that part wasn't able to withstand the radial load from the tool. Let's adjust this cam. So the 2D contour that we had that walked all the way around the part, instead of walking all the way down to it and then relying on only the adhesive between our part, let's drop it down. Heights, bottom height, we'll change to selection. I'm gonna pick that guy right there, okay. So we'll do that. When then we've still got the whole material holding this together with this section right here. And I'll update the rest of the tool pass. Let's run a second one. The other question is, what are your feeds and speeds? This material is made by Corning and they actually put out a speeds and feeds data sheet on it, which is super helpful. And what blew my mind was look at the milling cutting speeds, 20 to 35 surface feet per minute, tooth out per tooth and your depth of cut here. But take a look, if we pull up our speeds and feeds worksheet, 35 surface foot for a two millimeter or about 80 thousandths tool, that's only 1700 RPMs. That's incredibly slow for this small diameter of a tool. But I gotta say it worked great. So the third one just moved on us a little as we did this final 2D contour around it where we went with negative axial stock to leave. So we cut all the way through the material. So let's fix that. This is a common problem when you're holding things down with an adhesive and there's a good trick. So we're gonna change this 2D contour here. Instead of going 5 thou below, we're gonna stay 5 thou above it. Hit okay. So that leaves, again, 5 thou of material all the way around it. Right click, duplicate. We've got a new one, right click, edit that. This one, we are gonna go five thou below, but we're also gonna stay three thou off the sidewall. What that's going to do is it's gonna avoid the tool touching all of the part as it walks around because it's actually leaving a small shoulder around the part, but that shoulder's only about three thou uh, wide and five thou tall, so minuscule. Don't need a ramp, click OK. Let's go run that. One of the things that we did do, I feel like there's probably some room to increase the surface footage or RPMs. Uh, I didn't do that, but we did increase the feed rates to two and a half thousandths of an inch per two. Just trying to get an idea to see how does the material rack. What we didn't have problems with was any sort of a chip clogging or chip loading. We're using the fog buster with just air here though to make sure that we're blowing those chips out. We've got a zoom in lens, so this is incredibly zoomed in, but these parts are, I think they're about an inch, inch and a half in length and 0.4 inches wide or so. So they're very small parts. But that's what gets me excited about this. It's awesome to have really nice, really high-end machines, but in a case like this, the Tormach 440 is completely capable. And in fact, could be a great machine for you to set up and have it be a dedicated machine to do this sort of work. Uh, I would think about a different work holding solution. I don't like uh, how the tape was holding this onto the aluminum platter. But I do think you can improve that with two things. One, some better quality tapes. We're gonna do an article on that on the NYC CNC website. There's some pretty amazing technology out when it comes to tape adhesives. The second thing is would be to leave some tabs. 
leaving some tabs and coming back and trimming those off at the very end is gonna give you a lot more radial support as you do the finished profiling of the part but before you fully separate it away. Folks, hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. Take care. See you next Wednesday.